45 blast! <laughs> The 1986 NFL season began with 28 different teams in the championship chase, each charting a course they hoped would take them to a title. Sometimes a single voice was the call to glory. Let's go, attack, 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 set alert, set alert, set alert, set alert, 11, 11, that's okay. But all too often, championship dreams were given a rude awakening. He wouldn't do that. Slowly, the process of elimination pushed lesser teams out of contention. As autumn's colors gave way to November's frost, the playoff hopefuls had dwindled to a precious few. By season's end, only one team remained. Twenty-eight teams began the championship chase, but in the end, only one of them could truly be called Giants Among Men. There's an old Chinese proverb that says even the longest of journeys begins with a single step. The New York Giants Marathon Odyssey of 1986 actually began the year before amidst the icy chill of Soldier Field in Chicago. When the Giants were beaten by the Bears in the 1985 playoffs, the first seeds were sown for the championship season that was to follow. A bitter lesson came from the 21-0 defeat, a lesson that would serve the Giants well in 1986. If there's one thing we learned from the Chicago Bears last year is that the intensity level they played at was extremely high. And we always thought we were an intense team, I think. And uh, we found out from them that uh, uh, we have to step it up just one more notch. Sure, I think we have the horses to go all the way. Uh, but what you don't have, or what we don't have, and we won't know that we're going to have them, until we need them is, are the breaks and the players staying healthy. The Giants would begin to find the answers to their questions in the first game of the season. In Dallas, before a nationwide television audience, New York spotted the underdog Cowboys a 14-0 lead, then stormed back with a pair of touchdowns of their own. Quarterback Phil Simms put the ball in the air 45 times for 300 yards. And his third touchdown pass of the night, a juggling catch by Bobby Johnson, gave the Giants a 28-24 lead late in the game. However, the Cowboys mounted a late rally. And when Herschel Walker scored in the final moments, New York was handed a stunning defeat. But losses would be rare from then on. And the Giant defense would never allow this many points in any game the rest of the year. If any opponents could light up the scoreboard, it was the San Diego Chargers. Coming off an impressive 50-point explosion in their first game, quarterback Dan Fouts picked up where he left off, firing a first-half touchdown to running back Gary Anderson. 
but that was the sum total of the Chargers' output as San Diego stumbled the rest of the way. Fout suffered one of the worst days of his career, throwing five interceptions, including two each by safeties Kenny Hill and Terry Kennard. Six Charger possessions in the second half ended in turnovers, while the Giants' attack was not only more productive, but more fun to watch. Touchdowns from Joe Morris and wide receiver Lionel Manuel made the Giants' home opener a successful one. The game also marked the year's first Gatorade shower for head coach Bill Parcells, who would endure this soggy victory ritual nearly every week for the next five months. Victory would not come easily the following week as the Giants journeyed cross country to face the winless and angry Los Angeles Raiders. The silver and black led six nothing at the half, but then Joe Morris sparked the Giants who went on to win a game many expected them to lose. Solid passing performance from Phil Sims and a pair of touchdown catches from Lionel Manuel proved to be just enough offense as the Giants handed the Raiders their third straight defeat. Sims is back. Sims at the 18th. Throws end zone. It is hit. Touchdown off one of the Raider defenders. Wow. New York surprised many skeptics with the victory, but then just as quickly confused their fans the following week against the New Orleans Saints. The Giants were expected to make short work of the struggling Saints, but midway through the second period, the boys from the Bayou had a shocking 17-0 lead and seemed firmly in command. But any celebration on Bourbon Street was cut short when the Giant defense took over, shutting New Orleans out the rest of the game while limiting them to less than 200 yards in total offense. Once again, Phil Sims was forced to pass more than 40 times to spark the team. Zeke Moat's fourth quarter score put the Giants ahead for good, making this rally New York's biggest comeback effort in 16 years. Also providing offense was number 89, Mark Bavaro, who in only his second season rapidly developed into the best tight end in the NFL. In his college days, Bavaro was a member of Notre Dame's Fighting Irish. Now Mark was known as Rambo to his fans. But that's not only because he resembled Sylvester Stallone, Bavaro was a singular destructive force. And like the fictional John Rambo, it often took a whole army of men to contain him. In 1986, Bavaro battled his way to more receiving yards than a tight end in the NFC. He's physically tough. If there's a little weakness that we point out to him, the next day he's out working on it. He's just the kind of guy that, uh, if you had to go into the trenches tomorrow, that's the kind of guy you'd like to be in the trenches with. In the win over New Orleans, Bavaro reinforced his rugged image. Against the Saints, he caught seven passes for 100 yards after he had two teeth knocked out. Even with all his teeth, Bavaro was a man of few words. He intimidated his opponents with sheer physical ability and often coaches and teammates with his brooding silence. I tell you, he's a stone face, that Bavaro now. You know what the hell he's thinking. I didn't have to fight that son of a gun. Fortunately for the Giants, Bavaro only fought would-be tacklers, not his head coach. And don't get the idea that he never spoke. 
Bill Sims fondly recalled a conversation they had in 1985 in a victory over Houston. The thing was, it was late in the game. We had to be happened to beat in Houston uh, that day, 35 to 14, and of course. We were just running the ball. It finally comes down to the two-minute warning. We're glad this game's going to be over with. And we're standing in the huddle, and the play comes in. Oh, slant 35. Oh, okay. And I hear, I look at Mark, and he goes, oh. And I said, you know, he just makes a lot. I said, Mark, you know, what's wrong? You don't want to run that? He goes, I want to run it to the other side. And I said, well, what difference does it make? I want to hit him one more time. <laughs> you know, so there's somebody over there he must have had this thing going with, and he wanted to hit this guy just one more time before the game was over and uh, I guess leave this guy with impression that night before he went home. Lafaro looked like Stallone, played like Rambo, and became big box office in the Big Apple. But Bavaro was not New York's only star. He shared marquee space with a talented defensive corps that put on a punishing performance in St. Louis. New York grounded the Cardinals with seven sacks, further establishing themselves as one of the NFL's premier defenses. I would say right now the New York Giant defense is probably the best in pro football, just simply because they have four linebackers in the 250-pound category, and they're almost an immovable force up there. Number 56, Lawrence Taylor, continued to be New York's most dominant force. But blockers could not simply stop Taylor and expect to be successful. Now there was another threatening presence. Third year outside linebacker Carl Banks, number 58. I think he's added balance to our defense. Whereas before we had uh, a lot of dominant ball players predominantly on our right side, Carl has balanced that up and it's made us a more effective defense overall. With strength at both outside positions, opponents tried the only other choice available, going up the middle. But that proved to be no choice at all against the swarming unit that was still young and growing. We have a lot of fairly young people, you know, other than maybe Harry Carson uh, uh, and George Martin. Most of our guys are relatively young and ought to be getting better. They haven't peaked out yet by any means, and so I think that's a big asset. The Giants' defense of 1986 had a rich heritage and were part of a proud tradition. For it was the New York defenses of the 1950s that truly set the standards for the way defensive football is played today. It is the most tribal and universal of football fan rituals. Many NFL historians believe that this battle cry was first chanted in the mid-50s, originating from the rafters of New York's Yankee Stadium. In a game that climaxed the NFL's first season of nationally televised broadcasts, Millions of home viewers heard the deafening roar and watched the very responsive giant defense. New York crushed the Chicago Bears 47-7 for the championship. It marked the beginning of an eight-year era that saw a whole new type of slugging power come to the fabled house that Ruth built. It began when head coach Jim Lee Howell added a young Tom Landry to his already talented staff of assistants. Landry's innovative mind blended together with men like Jimmy Patton, Andy Robustelli and Jim Catcavage, Rosie Greer and Dick Bojaleski to produce the NFL's most dominant and difficult to detect defense of its day. first defensive team that all of a sudden started putting the good athletes over on defense. Up to that time, the better athletes, especially linemen, uh, running backs, were on the, on the offensive side. And all of a sudden, they started putting a little better athlete. Uh, then also, they went and started studying offensive formations and what teams were doing, which is what Tom does. It was a first 
Landry and that group had put together a defense that um, had certain uh, refinements to it that the offenses hadn't caught on to yet. One of those refinements was the creation of the 4-3 defense, designed to take advantage of the instinctive skills of middle linebacker Sam Huff. In this defense, the job of the four down linemen was to keep Huff clear of potential blockers, leaving him free to act as a rover, whose task was to always be in the vicinity of the football. This scheme was one of a number of ploys successfully used to neutralize New York's main nemesis, number 32, Jim Brown. Sam was basically the quarterback of that defense, and he had the flair to understand that he was in New York, so he became an instant celebrity by attaching himself to my legs quite often. We hit him whether he had the ball or not, and we knew that we had to stop Brown because their offense was built around him. Why shouldn't you, you know? The man averaged 5.2 yards a carry lifetime. Uh, we had to stop Jim Brown to beat the Cleveland Browns, and we were able to do it because of, of the defense we had in those days. We played a, what we call the coordinated defense. We were able to shut down the gaps for him where he couldn't find the gap to get through, and, and we were successful, probably better than anybody. No one stops him completely, obviously. He's too great a back to have that happen, but we slowed him down enough so that we ended up in the late 50s of being in a lot of championship games, and Cleveland wasn't. In addition to capably handling their rivals from Cleveland, the defense also became highly proficient at putting points on the board. This game day opportunism endeared the defense to the fans. Along with public praise and adulation, media attention was, for the first time, devoted to a defense. The giant defenders, teammates of mine, were not portrayed as mindless brutes, but rather as a group of friendly, thoughtful, and articulate men. This high-gloss treatment, however, did not wear well with all the members on our squad. There was a lot of animosity, a lot of jealousy between the offensive unit and the defensive unit because the defense really came into prominence for the first time, I guess, in the history of pro football. In those days, they didn't even introduce the defensive ball players. It was only the offensive ball players that were introduced before the game. And it was always, you know, ladies and gentlemen, number 16 from Southern California, Frank Gifford. In those days, when uh, Sam Huff was maybe making uh, eight or nine thousand and fighting Wellington Mara to make it ten, uh, I might have been making 18 or 20. That didn't sit too well with the likes of a Sam Huff. There was a little animosity about that because we were doing, on defense, we were doing an awful lot of playing and we were holding teams, you know, to, to six points and to three points. And we went three games, I remember, and never scored a touchdown offensively. And we won two of them. At one period, you know, when we'd come off the field, uh, Sam might say, see if you can hold them, we'll try and score on defense the next time around. Despite the presence of any ill will, those who played with and against this unit all agreed they were pioneers in the effort to bring teamwork and intellect to defense. The most intelligent def defensive club in football, the New York Giants. Every man knew his position, knew what he was supposed to do, knew where he was supposed to help out. They played together probably as well as any team I've ever coached. They had just a sense of feel, you know, between each other. It was a good football team. It was, it was good talent, but it wasn't really any better than, than some of the teams in those days. But their ability to play together and believe in each other, the way they believed in each other, was tremendous. In 1960, Tom Landry moved on to coach the expansion Dallas Cowboys. But the men he left behind went on to play in three more NFL championships. Although the Giants came up short in each of them, the defense performed bravely, particularly in the bitter struggles against Green Bay in 1962 and Chicago in 1963. Historically, the Giants' defensive dominance ended with the title game against the Bears. While one era was passing, a new one was dawning. Various retirements and trades closed this chapter of defensive brilliance. But a symbolic seed was transplanted with Rosie Greer's transfer to the Rams, where he helped give celebrity status to L.A.'s suddenly famous 
fearsome foursome. It was the start of a colorful age in professional football where dominant defenses no longer lacked adulation and recognition. So whether they were called the Purple People Eaters, the Steel Curtain, or Doomsday, all of them owed a small debt of gratitude to a group of men who came together in New York Yankee Stadium and who were simply called the Giants defense. The 1986 version of the Giants' defense stood tall in a week six meeting with the Eagles. Linebacker Lawrence Taylor led the way with seven solo tackles and four quarterback sacks. Through three quarters, Philadelphia was held to zero total yards and had only a field goal to show for their efforts. The Giants, however, had no trouble scoring, doing so in a variety of ways. With blocking from fullback Maurice Carthon, Joe Morris got the first score of the game. And then quarterback Phil Sims followed by notching his first touchdown of 1986. In the third period, the Giants called on an unexpected volunteer, capping a rousing play that innocently began as a field goal attempt. Snap, spot. It was the first touchdown reception of linebacker Carson's 11-year career. And then New York closed out the scoring as young Lee Roussan, number 22, scored his first NFL touchdown. The Giants easily rolled to their fifth straight and most convincing win, but would have a much tougher time the following week. Traveling to the Pacific Northwest to face the Seahawks, the Giants used some early turnovers to gain a 9-7 halftime lead, earned by a Phil Simms touchdown pass to rookie wide receiver Solomon Miller, number 87. But seven Seattle sacks and four interceptions, along with a pair of Seahawk touchdowns, proved too much to overcome, as New York lost its second game of the season. It marked the last time any opponent's fans could cheer victoriously in 1986. The Giants would not lose another game. Victory was absolutely vital in a week eight meeting with the first place Redskins. A Monday night crowd was keeping one eye on the field watching the Giants and another on their portable TVs looking at the Mets. In both contests, these bifocal fans got the results they wanted. Joe Morris rushed for 181 yards to help the Giants gain an early lead against Washington. When Phil Simms hit Bobby Johnson to make it 23 in the third quarter, the Giants appeared to be in control. But 17 straight Redskin points tied the game with four minutes remaining. New York responded as Joe Morris came through in the game's final moment. Big play. Sims to Morris. Morris has the first. Four, ten, five. Touchdown, baby. Yes. yes. The win moved the Giants into a three-way tie for first, along with the Redskins and Cowboys, who came to the Meadowlands intent on sweeping the season series with New York. Dallas instead saw their quarterback swept under the rug on six Giants sacks. <laughs> Even when the Cowboys converted big plays, the Giants had the last lap as three Dallas turnovers left tears in the eyes of Texas. Although the Cowboys outgained their hosts by nearly 200 yards in total offense, New York made the key plays in critical moments to preserve the win. For the second straight week, the offensive hero was running back Joe Morris, who rushed for over 180 yards and two touchdowns. This began a series of stirring last-minute defensive struggles that continued the following week when the Giants journeyed down the turnpike for a rematch with Philadelphia.
This second meeting of the season with the Eagles was far more competitive than the first, but the Giants were clearly in command from the outset. A dash of passing offense blended well with a heavy portion of Joe Morris running, who gained over 100 yards and scored two touchdowns. However, Joe's duties proved to be a bit more hazardous than he might have expected. The Eagles' less than hospitable treatment to their guests was paid back with interest as the Giants knocked quarterback Ron Jaworski out of the game and treated his replacement just as harshly, en route to seven quarterback sacks. More of this intensity would be needed a week later in one of the season's most pivotal games. The chill of a Minnesota winter wrapped its halo around the frozen Metrodome. While indoors, the Giants' defense put the Viking attack on ice. In a low-scoring first half, New York's swarming defenders held the opposition to only six points. Meanwhile, kicker Raul Allegre supplied the offense, booting four field goals. And with Joe Morris acting as a decoy, Phil Sims fired a fourth-quarter touchdown pass to Bobby Johnson, giving New York a 19-13 lead. But the Vikings rallied when backup quarterback Wade Wilson found Anthony Carter for what appeared to be the winning score. With barely a minute to play, the Giants trailed 2019 and were in deep trouble. It was this moment that Phil Sims stepped forward and orchestrated the most important drive of his career. Sims was at his combative best, making play after play when the Vikings should have buried him. Finally came the critical moment upon which the Giants' season turned. Sims is going to be down behind and center on this play. The shotgun wouldn't work, there's too much noise. McConkey comes in motion to the right-hand side. Sims drops back to the 40. Sims throws. Complete him, he's in. What a catch by Johnson. This clutch play not only set up Allegra's winning field goal, it told the Giants they could win, no matter how difficult the situation. The thrilling victory also proved to be a vindication of sorts for Sims who now heard cheers instead of the jeers that had haunted him from the very first day he became a Giant. New York Giants first round selection. Quarterback Phil Simms, Moorhead State. Life as a Giant had never come easy for Simms. His early seasons ended with injury. For nearly two years, he was benched while others performed. But through it all, Simms survived. And in 1986, he became the winningest quarterback in pro football. His performance provided not just dazzle, but also the glint of steel that all great quarterbacks must have. Here's a guy who's had a fight through adversity probably as much or more than anybody else with a, with a press that was, has been on him and the fans have been on him. Uh, but he had a fight through it by himself, and I think that uh, you know, he, he willed himself into being an outstanding performer. The trials of the past had served to toughen Sims. As he was leading the Giants to a world championship, it became clearly apparent that there were few NFL players who operated better under pressure. Move it. Move it, move it, move it. As a quarterback, I don't ever feel the pressure. The, you know, big games, every game is the same. You know, every situation feels the same. You just do what you've been taught to do. You're almost like a robot, you know, in a way. You just go out there and do it because you've done it hundreds of times in practice. Third and 12, the ball is on the 16. Sims is back at the 25, looking for a target. He's going end zone. Touchdown! What a catch by Phil McConkey in the back corner. Double team. The leader of this ball club, Phil Sims, came back and says, you can do it. Here's the pass. He throws a beauty. There was a time where I felt the offense didn't have a leader. There were just a bunch of guys up there playing and, and trying to uh, not lose a game. And... And they didn't have uh, one person to, to really tie them all together and to lead them anywhere. Uh, Phil has really taken on that responsibility, and he has done a very good job. Always feisty, Sims now used his aggressiveness to his benefit rather than his detriment. 
He had neither the NFL's best arm nor the quickest legs, but he had learned how to win and how to lead. I would rather have no other quarterback behind the center than Phil Sims, especially in those tight situations. The guy's proven over and over again he can get the job done. And on offense, we have a, we have a lot of faith, faith in him. Sims became New York's leader on offense, while veteran George Martin provided leadership and inspiration on defense. Throughout his 12-year career, Martin, number 75, had scored more touchdowns than any defensive lineman in NFL history. Not bad for an 11th round pick in the 1975 college draft. On special teams, on defense, even as an occasional tight end, Martin demonstrated an uncanny ability to score points. Whenever opportunity knocked, George Martin always seemed to be in the right place at the right time. In 1986, injuries to other linemen forced this pass rushing specialist into becoming a full-time starter, a challenge he met with enthusiasm. It's always served as a motivational uh, tactic for me to go out and try to keep up with the younger guys, but uh, also I've been endowed with an awful lot of pride, and uh, I will not settle for anything less than my best. He's a tremendous example for young players, and he inspires me. He can inspire greatness in other people just by his behavior, so uh, he's terrific. I hope he plays five more years. The team's elder statesman did more than inspire and motivate. Against the Giants' eventual Super Bowl opponents, the Martin Magic emerged again as George made one of the biggest plays of the season. Motion toward the middle by Vance Johnson. Elway is looking for a target, goes out to the right side, intercepted, George Martin! Martin's 78-yard marathon was the only touchdown New York would score, but the defense made it stand up by keeping Denver out of the end zone for much of the game. With two minutes remaining, Denver scored to tie the game at 16. But once again, Phil Sims came through with more 11th hour heroics. A 46-yard pass to Phil McConkey set the stage for another game-winning kick from Raul Alegre. Snap, the spot, the kick, the drop, it is good! The two teams would meet again in the Super Bowl in Pasadena. But New York's immediate concern was in another California city, San Francisco, where the 49ers proved to be a formidable foe. San Francisco jumped out to a 17-0 halftime lead. But then Mark Bavaro's crunching catch and carry completely changed the tempo of the game. Bavaro's individual effort galvanized the once sleeping Giants, who responded with three unanswered scores, two coming on Phil Simms' touchdown passes. With Sims throwing for a season-high 388 yards and the defense shutting out San Francisco in the second half, the Giants achieved the kind of comeback victory that championship seasons are made of. Ahead lay the Redskins in hostile RFK Stadium. To the winner would go first place in the NFC East and the inside track to the division title. The game was close in the beginning. But then the Giants broke it open on the strength of Sims scores to Bobby Johnson, Mark Bavaro, and Phil McConkey, giving New York more than enough points for a victory. The Redskins would not be nearly as prolific. The giant defense hounded Washington quarterback Jay Schrader all day, forcing six interceptions and collecting four sacks. As usual, the spearhead was linebacker Lawrence Taylor, number 56.
Taylor's heroics helped put the Giants within one game of clinching the division crown. It was the same ferocious form that made LT the NFL's leading pass rusher with 20 and a half sacks. the most dominating player that we've seen on defense. I've never seen anybody as big as he is, as fast as he, as he is, and as relentless as he is. Yeah, he, he's relentless. Uh, he has a motor that never goes off. He plays the game a thousand miles an hour, and he's really the most prolific football player that we have to face year in and year out. Phenomenal blitzer. He comes from everywhere all the time. When you hit T, you have to take inventory. You have to see if everything's still hooked up. And, uh, you know, you get up and you start shaking and you make sure your legs are there, your arms are there and everything else. And, and hopefully he doesn't get there too often during the course of the game. Quite simply, Taylor spelled trouble. Throughout his career, he has posed unique problems for offensive linemen. As Comrade Dover, Dover said, you hold them, then you leg whip them. If that doesn't work, then you tackle them. I feel there's an honor any time a team has to reconstruct their offense or, or do different things and to, um, to block me or, or to take care of me. After a 1985 campaign that was not up to his personal standards, Taylor roared back in 86 to dominate football like no other player in the game. Beyond his physical gifts, he has the extraordinary ability to concentrate, to harness great mental intensity hand in glove with his athletic ability. I know Lawrence Taylor very well. He's a, as a catalyst. He can, he can provide uh, a lot of things to a team. He told me before the season what he was gonna do. So I really didn't make any prediction. I knew what he was going to do because he told me. Taylor proved to be as much a prophet as a predator, and he achieved all his personal goals while his team earned a championship. I'm not a very uh, technique-oriented person anyway as far as playing the, my position. You never know exactly what you're going to do until the last instant before the ball is snapped, and then that's where creativity comes in. I tell you, I, I can go in and run some stunts that they never even heard of, but if it works, I keep running it. I still rely a lot on instinct, on feel. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, I'm in trouble. But throughout his six NFL seasons, it's usually the opposition who is in great peril, not LT. A man with a bark as bad as his bite. Hey, Sean, you better hope I never get back in there. I will kick your Hey, baby, let's go out there like a bunch of crazy dogs and have some fun. Son, I got to do that in this. The more threatened he feels, the more competitive he becomes. He thinks that he can will anything to happen on the field. I love showing my enthusiasm for the game. When I first came here to the Giants, there's one thing they did not have here was enthusiasm um, for, you know, big plays. And I do believe every time somebody scores a touchdown on defense, if I'm close to him, I'm going to jump on and, you know, try to wring his neck. Taylor's amazing achievements were equally worth celebrating. 17 years before, Alan Page of the Minnesota Vikings became the first defensive player ever to be named league MVP. No other defender would earn that honor again until Lawrence Taylor in 1986. Taylor became the focal point of one of the league's greatest defenses, the rallying force of a powerful unit. But he was by no means the only star in the Meadowlands. In the Giants' Week 15 game with St. Louis, the entire New York defense played with Taylor-like ferocity. In storming to a team record nine quarterback sacks, pressure came from defensive stalwarts Jim Burke, Leonard Marshall, Gary Reason, Andy Hedden, 
Pepper Johnson, Jerome Sally, and Eric Howard. Giants also got 179 rushing yards and three touchdowns from Joe Morris and became division champions for the first time in 23 years. The only prize unclaimed was home field advantage for the playoffs, a prize plucked by the Giants in the final game of the regular season. The only obstacle standing in their way was the Green Bay Packers, and the offense bowled them over, scoring the first 24 points of the game. The first touchdown came on a Sims to Mark Bavaro pass, a combination that would strike again in the second half. On this day, Bavaro became the first tight end in Giants history to gain 1,000 yards receiving. Sims fired a third touchdown to Zeke Moat, all part of the biggest point explosion by a Giants team since 1972. The most satisfying play came from special teamer Tom Flynn. Only a few months before, Flynn had been unceremoniously cut by the Packers. In a moment of delicious irony, Flynn, number 28, exacted a sweet measure of revenge. regular season, the winningest in team history, was finally over. Ahead lay the playoffs with home field advantage throughout. This team had long been bridesmaids, but they would not suffer that fate this time. The New York Giants were about to take their final steps toward a world championship. Not far from the Giants' home in the Jersey Meadowlands, a native son of the Garden State was born and raised. He grew up to become their head coach, and in four years, Bill Parcells molded the Giants into his kind of team. Billy, make sure you remind him. I might try something big early. Yeah. I... Okay. Last time I told you guys that, you forgot to remember. Remember? Don't worry about doing everything perfect now. Just get out there and run like hell and catch it. All right? All right. You know what I mean? Like a street gang. Parcells' players were a mirror of the man: tough, demanding, and unpretentious. In a town where 240 hitters owned Cadillacs, this was a four-wheel drive team. To such men, Parcells could be a sensitive big brother one moment, a stern disciplinarian the next. Man, when he starts, you know, coaching, I mean, when he starts coaching, everybody say, oh, watch out, Bill's coaching again, you know. That means he's, he's worried and, he's, and, and he wants to play well. So um, anytime he starts coaching, Man, watch out, because the guy's on the warpath. Hey, I don't need 10 guys suggesting players. He's calling them. Call what you want to call them. You guys shut up. When Parcells won, which was often, he became the reluctant victim of his players' mischief. Each week, with victory secure, team captain Harry Carson performed a ritual as beloved as a Taylor sack or a Morris touchdown. Fans once scurried to the parking lot to beat the traffic, but now they stayed, eager to witness the victory bath that awaited Bill Parcells. It was a symbolic act for a team that hoped to wash away the memories of every ghost who ever dressed in giant colors. 1963 marked the last time the Giants played in the championship. Thoughts of Y.A. Tittle, Frank Gifford, and head coach Ali Sherman still lingered. Against the Bears that year, New York played valiantly but lost 14-10, a much different ending from their very first championship victory many, many years before. 
I think the game in, in, in all the years that really sticks in my memory as a whole game is our championship game with the Bears in 1934. Bears had a great team. I think they came in undefeated. Bronco Nagurski was at his prime. Bronco was the style he had of running uh, with his shoulders not too far from the ground. He was a tall man, about 6'2 and 220. And if you tackle him low, he'd trample you to death. If you tackle him high, he'd carry you 10 yards. At halftime, I believe we were down by 13 to 3, and we were pretty well beaten. The field was absolutely frozen. Ray Flaherty, who was our captain and an assistant coach, had come from Gonzaga University in Spokane, and he remembered that in one of his college games, his team had worn sneakers on a frozen field, giving them a great advantage. We couldn't find a sporting goods store in New York that was open. We had an assistant clubhouse man named Abe Cohen with us, who also worked for Manhattan College. We put him in a taxi cab and sent him up to Manhattan College to get the shoes for the basketball team, the sneakers for the basketball team. Just before the second half started, he had 12 pairs of the largest sneakers he could find, so we put them on. And we could see him putting on tennis shoes in there. Well, we thought, oh, hey, that's, that's uh, foolish. I said, I've got to help them. We're going to walk all over their feet. Right away, we said something was wrong because they had good footing, and we didn't have good footing. And we were slipping and sliding around, and they were running all over us. And they started just piling up yardage and getting in position, and they'd be, end up beating us uh, 30 to 13. They just outsmarted us, I guess. That, that was about the size of it. It was legal. There was nothing wrong with it. But I remember during that game, George Hallis would come out on the field, and he'd look at those sneakers and just shake his head, walk off grumbling. In the first round of the playoffs, the Giants needed no special shoes, but the 49ers could have used form-fitting gloves. Montana looking right, swing pass, Rice has got it to 40, 35, 30, he's going to go, he dropped the ball, knocked out of his hand, he picks it up near the goal line, lost it again, Giants have it! Well, they need a big play, they did get it. This squandered opportunity early in the game devastated San Francisco, and they never recovered from the shock. The Giants battered the deflated Niners, holding them to under 200 yards and forcing four turnovers, while piling up the third most lopsided playoff win in NFL history. New York knocked quarterback Joe Montana out of the game and made life miserable for backup Jeff Kent. The Niners, boasting the NFC's number one offense, were simply overmatched. While the walls caved in on San Francisco, Phil Simms' pass protection was near perfect. Behind the blocking of Benson, Ard, Oates, Godfrey, and Nelson, the giant quarterback had all the time he needed to pick the 49ers apart. The Giants' first score of the day came from a familiar passing combination. Sims is looking for a target. Sims, end zone! Touchdown, Milano! Sims threw a second touchdown pass to Bobby Johnson and entrusted ball-carrying duties to Joe Morris. During the regular season, the Niners held Joe to only 14 yards. They weren't as successful this time. Catch in the backfield, Morris coming left across the line of scrimmage. Morris had over 100 yards rushing well before halftime, and New York inflicted further damage when a field goal attempt suddenly transformed into a trick play engineered by holder Jeff Rutledge. The flustered 49ers were powerless to stop a completion to Mark Bavaro that set up yet another New York touchdown. Bill Sims made history by becoming the first giant quarterback to throw for four touchdowns in a playoff game. And even the defense contributed to the avalanche of points. Montana inside the 10, throws wildly.
Joe Morris' second touchdown of the day closed out the biggest playoff scoring spree in team annals. Having seen their heroes pour on the points, the fans now awaited the victory shower that was sure to cascade on Coach Bill Parcell. The Niners were finished. Ahead lay the conference championship and a familiar and dangerous foe. A giant celebration was near with the champagne put on ice. Look out, Parcells. For the third time in the same season, the Giants would face the Redskins. This one for the NFC crown. It was showtime. New York was as overwhelming as the Meadowlands wind, storming to a 17-0 halftime lead. Washington's opportunities were few and vanished quickly. Neither their quarterback or their coach could stop the inexorable giant assault that would send them down to defeat. The Redskins were a beaten team, the Giants Super Bowl bound. All that remained was the final gun, the glory, and the Gatorade. Denver Broncos came to Super Bowl 21 hoping they would win. The New York Giants came knowing they would. The Giants had bullied and beaten opponents all year. After dominating the regular season and playoffs, nothing would stop Bill Parcells' team on Super Sunday. New York took an early 7-3 lead, but easy victory disappeared on the vapor trails made by John Elway's right arm. Elway's one-man show played center stage in the giant end zone. Denver reclaimed the 10-7 lead. But the Bronco fans saw the silver lining in this Super Bowl disappear when the giant defense began to pound on their golden boy. The safety was worth more than two points as it marked Denver's demise and the beginning of giant superiority. In the first half, the Giants were characters in the story. In the second, 
They authored their script for Super Bowl XXI. Mark Bavaro's touchdown began an onslaught of giant points. Hockey comes in motion to the right-hand side. Pitch, Mars returns around, back to Sims, on the flea flicker. Sims is looking way downfield. He's got a receiver. Complete, out of the ten. Five. Touchdown, I believe. And the are going to one. Here we go. One yard needed for a touchdown. And off Mars is going to get it. It was like Katie by the door. In a dazzling performance that made history, game MVP Phil Simms picked Denver apart. The Giants scored 30 second-half points to set a Super Bowl record. Phil McConkie's touchdown was not the official end of Super Bowl XXI, but the official start of the victory celebration and the coronation of the New York Giants as champions of the world. guy Giants, a pick and shovel team, blue collar champion, boys at heart, but Giants among men. <laughs> 